For those of you who don't know me, my name's Christian Henson. I write music for Well Coiffured, is that how you pronounce it? Belgian detectives, misogynistic petrol heads, potty mouth teenagers, and I'm currently writing the music for what I think is some of the best TV made in the UK today, but I am biased. Moreover, I co-founded Spitfire Audio, and one of the most fantastic surprises and great honours that has come out of that has been meeting composers. Not hundreds of them, but thousands. And what this gives me is a consensus that I can share with fellow composers. What I have found by meeting composers that range from people who have just left college, people are struggling to find their kind of foothold on the career ladder. Or indeed composers who write music for Christopher Nolan films. I also do lots of tutorials, seminars and interviews, both being the interviewee and being the interviewer. And a question that's often asked is, if you had one piece of advice, what would that be? And I'd say this one piece of advice is the thing you have to do. But before we get onto that, Price's Law. Derek J. DeSola Price is a mathematician who studied workplaces and came up with some fascinating empirical evidence. His law states, the square root of the number of people in any creatively productive domain do 50% of the work. So when you have only 100 people in a domain, 10 people will be doing 50% of the work. This is not a theory, it is a proven fact. And it can be applied to literature, to record sales, but also composers. Only five composers account for 50% of all of the classical music performed today. Bach, Brahms, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky and Kanye, sorry, Mozart. And only 5% of what they wrote is being played 50% of the time. I estimate there's about a thousand media composers who are making a living out of writing music for film, TV and computer games today. So that means a 990,000 composers fighting over the other 50% of the pie. It is a poor distribution of wealth. How do you tip the balance? So a lot of people will say, well, surely you have to be talented. Well, I have met many, many talented composers who have yet to find that kind of rung on the ladder. Many people will say, well, you need to be determined and ambitious. Well, I have seen people who are determined and ambitious to a fault. This is, after all, a team game. And if you're only out for yourself, it's likely you might not get off the bench. What about being well educated? A good theoretician, take someone like Ben Valfish, who I've had the pleasure of working with, is, I would say, one of the most theoretically gifted composers I've ever met. But there are plenty of successful composers who don't have that kind of background. Irvin Berlin couldn't read music. What about being lucky? Well, I don't know about you, but I've squandered as many lucky opportunities as I have embraced them. The spectre of self-sabotage is something that clouds our industry for some reason. So these things can help being ambitious, lucky, well-educated and talented, but they themselves will not ensure success. But psychologists say that there are some key indicators that are common amongst everyone who operate in this kind of 50% bracket of creativity. A modicum of intelligence is required. Now, psychologists suggest that intelligence isn't a marker of success. It just enables someone to be able to deal with complex situations in an effective manner. Another empirical need of success is conscientiousness, the drive to create work brilliantly, whilst also being highly productive. And I guess getting that balance right, being productive whilst being conscientious, is one of the kind of infernal battles that we face as composers. I would say that these indicators are absolutely common amongst every successful composer I have met, without exception. And not two out of three, three out of three every single time. But they themselves, I suspect, are not guarantees of success. So how do you tip the balance? Well, there's a problem, a problem with film music. It all sounds the fucking same. Once a director has heard his or her second showreel of orchestral music, it simply blurs into a kind of vat of homogenous singularity. This woman is my mum. She's had a hugely successful career from being the dairy box girl in the 1950s all the way to being Sherlock Holmes's landlady. She started out as a chorus girl 
a member of a chorus line. If ever there was Price's Law writ large within a proscenium arch, a chorus line would be it. Ten people dancing behind your star. She got noticed by kicking her shoe off into the crowd. And she also had a fairly unusual haircut. Why do I mention her? Well, I think that she dared to be different. And dare it is, because I don't think as humans, being different is something we're necessarily drawn to. I think I inherited my mother's strain of this kind of wanting to be different, which is why the people I went to school with used to go, oi, why are you being so extra? And used to beat me up. But being different, I think, is crucial. To be one of the thousand working composers against the other 999,000 struggling ones is unusual. So that's what you have to be. Unusual, a unicorn. Or as Oscar Wilde put it, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Or something like that. So, the most important thing you need to do... OK, I'm going to sound like a stuck record here, but the thing you have to do is find your own voice. I know I've said this before, and I know you've probably heard it before. And it's not bullshit. It's not like when you see someone being interviewed and being asked if there was one piece of advice and they answer, just believe in yourself. That is bullshit. But finding your own voice is absolutely fundamental. OK, so it's all very well for me to say something as, as airy as find your own voice, something I've struggled with over the years. But I'm going to give you 10 tips accompanied by 10 cues and I'm not going to tell you uh, what the cues are from, and it might be fun for you to have a guess. Put it in the comments down below. OK, I know this sounds silly coming from a sample developer, but 10. Don't rely on other people's sounds. And if you do, use them wrong. I believe Hilda made this world out of playing factories, literally using factories as musical instruments. And it creates just a terrifying, very alien world that I find utterly compelling. Nine, don't copy other people. But if you do, make sure they're brilliant and unexpected. I once spoke to a composer who said uh, his route to originality was not copying one composer or two composers, but copying and combining the influence of three. Write some music that sounds like it's written by Bach, Jimi Hendrix, and I don't know, why did Lamar go into my head? What I love about that score is it's a science fiction score and it, it proved what I've always believed, that recorders are cool, says a long-suffering recorder player. And that's what can be so frustrating about people who are original. They're so original, it's obvious. I'm a recorder player and I listen to that score and go, so? It's just recorders. I could have done that, but the fact is I didn't. Eight. Lean into your uniqueness. Now, this next composer I'm going to feature twice, and for good reason. But this score, in my very humble opinion, is the last great score of the 20th century. For me, whenever I meet composers who have an ability like Gustavo does, i.e. playing the guitar, I'm always really despondent when I hear them making orchestral music. Here is a man at one with his instrument, creating simplistic music that moves you to the core. This film, if you can work out what it's from, is great to watch on headphones because you know when a cue's going to come in because you can hear the amp and the tremolo pedal turn up. They say style is defined by your limitations. My blind spots lead me down alleys that my more esteemed and well-educated colleagues wouldn't dream of treading. Uh, my inability to create orchestral music that I feel is distinctive and original means I rely more on distortion and warping, which is why these things are so important to me.
these small number of notes won an Oscar. An absolutely sublime score that helped tell the story so well. I've just started a film score and I've dared to be as insanely simplistic as this score that you've just heard is. I presented the, the theme suite to the director and the director responded saying, whatever you do, do not make it any more complicated than this. And my theme, it is just three notes. Being belligerently, if not almost arrogantly confident in the beauty of simplicity can be a very refreshing thing. There is so much to compete with, dialogue, sound design. The job of a film score is very much part of a bigger tapestry. So don't take out all of your brushes and totally overwhelm the canvas. This is a collaborative effort. Six, embrace your heritage. And when I talk of heritage, it, it, it's not the heritage of the, the land in which you grew up or, or uh, your parents' traditions and all of that. I'm talking about your heritage, your experience, every single piece of music, every single film you've watched, every TV show you've seen throughout your life will inform your decisions. Your heritage is your own personal artistic DNA. Embrace it. <laughs> So this score is the most important score of my life. Gustavo gathering folk instruments around him, charangos, and I think a thing called a ronroco, to create modern music with traditional instruments. Now the reason I say this is the most important score is this score featured these amazing guitars and I took the soundtrack to a folk music shop in London called Hobgoblin Music and they identified one of the guitars as a Chirango. I bought the Chirango, I took it home, it became immediately obvious that I couldn't play it so I sampled it and that was the kind of <laughs> moment for me that is my half of how Spitfire came to be. Five, enrich your heritage. Or as John Powell said, don't listen to fucking film music. John Powell's heritage is about as rich as it gets because he used to write jingles back in the day when people wrote jingles. This meant that every day John was having to write and produce music from different idioms, which is what makes his scores so brilliant, probably one of the best score producers on the planet today. This is an unexpected cue from a massive film, which is so engaging in its beauty and draws from John's rich heritage. Four, collaborate with extraordinary people. Hans is not only the most successful living composer, in my humble opinion, but also, I think, one of the greatest collaborators, whether it be with engineers, with his ever-expanding family of uh, musicians, which he's incredibly devoted to, other composers, or indeed directors. This score, I think, is a testament to his celebration of the power of collaboration. Three, restrict your options. This is the sound of a steel band. Okay, so hold that sound in your head. This next cue is from a science fiction film written by Cliff Martinez, who does a lot of collaborations with Steven Soderbergh. That in itself, how that came to be, is a story well worth checking out. But anyway, uh, legend has it, he has a rule that if he's going to buy a new musical instrument or a new piece of tech, he has to use it in the, the next film score that he's going to work on. And I think that he heard some steel band music and being a percussionist, former drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he thought, I'm going to learn how to make some calypso music and bought some steel drums. Then the phone went. Steven Soderbergh's on the other end and went, Cliff, we're doing a science fiction film. At which point Cliff looks at his steel drums and goes...
two, experiment and go on adventures. This next excerpt is by Thomas Newman, who is one of those rare composers who, who you can usually guess within a bar of hearing his music. I think he's possibly the greatest embodiment of these 10 tips. Someone who has embraced his influences and has merged them into a harmonic language of his own. He creates small, limited sound worlds, but is also massively collaborative with musicians. And with these musicians, he appears to stoke adventure and exploration and an exoticness, even when the subject matter doesn't require it. This cue is from one of Thomas Newman's most listened to scores and really embraces him challenging the paradigm in a quietly revolutionary way. One, do it your way. If I was to thank my uh, beloved deceased father for one thing, uh, that was uh, that we were good enough. You don't have to aspire to be someone else. And the way that you do things if it contributes to your conscientious approach to work and your pro productivity, then your way is the right way, is good enough. This next one is by Dario, who I'm a massive fan of and also I'm very honoured to say that I've worked with on a few projects. And I've seen him work and it's fascinating. Very individual way of working. Digital performer and he's connected to it by a breath controller. I've not asked him this directly, but certainly listening to his scores, he seems to avoid common time wherever possible. This is an Oscar-winning score for Dario Marianelli, where he takes the typewriter in the scene and turns it into a musical instrument. And that's a leitmotif that returns throughout the score alongside other sound effects. The bashing of an umbrella on a car bonnet features as a sonic leitmotif throughout this sensational score. The one time I did this right in my career was with my brother Joe and his business partner Alexis Smith. We were asked to pitch against maybe 10 other composers for a computer game. And we were given a sequence which was very kind of testosterone-led, very dramatic, very action. And I said to Joe and Alexis, I think we need to prove how creative we can be. So what we did is we took some of Steve Reich's singers and created some minimalistic and very simplistic voices uh, accompanied by some very simple string parts in a way that worked against the picture but to dramatic effect. We won the pitch and that score was the score for the computer game Alien Isolation which we got nominated for a BAFTA for. Now, did the score sound like our pitch? No, but the pitch itself stood out and I believe it made the developers understand that we would try anything and everything to create something truly special, a unicorn score, a unicorn piece of work, to give it its own voice. So, if you want to get out of the chorus line, I know it sounds all kind of, hey man, you've got to find your own voice. This is what you have to do. We've had a really tough year, we've been locked up, and I think there's a few more months, just months to go, but we'll be rolling our sleeves up soon. An opportunity, the end of 2020, to think about how you're gonna approach 2021. Here's your opportunity to become a unicorn. Thanks for watching to the end. And again, if you want to name the scores, 10 through to one, that'd be brilliant. It'd be very interesting to see what you think they are. Some I think are very easy, straightforward, some maybe not so. Subscribe if you haven't done already. Ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put a video up. I'm one of those, always much appreciated. See you next time.